Welcome everyone, my name is Samantha Oakley from ALA's Public Programs Office. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're excited to have Andrea Blackman with us today to speak about how Nashville Public Library has partnered with local law enforcement agencies to develop an innovative program series that uses history as a gateway to productive, critical conversations on race, policing, and human rights. I'd like to start things off with a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org ccf. Hopefully many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars like this one. Finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end. Also, if you have any technical issues, please send a private message to Colleen Barbas. To do so, hover over Colleen's name in the, right, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click Start Private Chat. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Andrea Blackman. Since 2003, Andrea has co coordinated Nashville Public Library's nationally recognized civil rights room and collection. During her tenure, she has led 10 successful oral history projects and managed the expansion of the library's public programming. She serves on the board of directors for the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition and the Tennessee Historical Records Advisory Board. With that, I'll turn things over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, first, let me thank ALA and also you, Samantha, for this opportunity. I want to also thank the Public Programs Office for the support and the interest of what we've been doing here at NPL and in Nashville in particular. Our program that we'll talk a little bit today um, is about conversations. It's about public programs. It's nothing new that we've been doing in the profession, but we think what we've been do how we've been doing it here in Nashville is new and the practice and so forth. So we'll go ahead and get started. Civil rights and a civil society. Again, I mentioned earlier the idea that public libraries serve as this launch pad for civic engagement and civil rights. It's nothing new. Um, I'm drawn to what happened in Utah with a group called Utah Against Police Brutality, and where the community members got together at the Salt Lake City Public Library to have town hall meetings, to have community conversations as a response to the police shootings that we've seen around our country. And then I'm also reminded of what happened in Minneapolis when high school students gathered in front of Minneapolis Central Library um, to share poetry and remarks before they marched downtown in protest to the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner. So what we have been doing in our profession and in the public library realm of hosting these conversations, giving our public voice, none of this is new. Um, I do think that the public library has been and is a place and a space for us to continue to offer our community the opportunity to share their civil rights, and we will do that in supporting our community. So one of the questions we grappled with early in designing this program is how are we at NPL going to respond to what we see are unfolding in society, in our city, and around the country? And how can we use a physical space and place a specific format and a specific method to create a program model, what we have coined as civil rights and a civil society. <clears throat> the civil rights room is housed at our main library. Nashville's library system has 21 locations, and the civil rights room and the collection are actually housed downtown at Maine. The room was designed specifically to highlight Nashville's role during the modern civil rights movement. The program, Civil Rights in a Civil Society, was designed to use this physical room utilizing its architecture, using its archival images, oral histories, and footage that we have from Nashville's um, sit-in demonstrations to use Nashville's history as a gateway to have productive conversations around issues that have 
plagued our city, plagued our country, and around these prevailing issues affecting law enforcement in Nashville and any city's increasingly diverse population. So it was through the use of a historic framework that we designed this program with the use of the Civil Rights Room as the backdrop. It's an intentional space designed and created for conversation, personal reflection, and to question narratives and counter question those narratives as well. The Civil Rights Room has been um, a part of our city and our library's landscape since 2003. When you actually walk into the physical space, you are greeted by oversized black and white photos, two of them you see on the screen now. Our program, how did all of this get started? Um, this is the question that I think I have been asked the most in the past year. Wh whose idea was it to create a program where you bring law enforcement officers in to talk about issues and how our city is grappling with issues with police? So the idea of civil rights in a civil society actually began, its genesis parallels everything that was going on in our country. So we have Trayvon Martin's death in 2000. Uh, 12, we have our country being plagued from 2014 in July to November with Michael Brown, Eric Garner, um, Tamir Rice, everything that we have watched unfold in our country. Our police chief, um, Chief Anderson, and his training team actually approached the public library. They came to us with this idea of creating a training class for all new recruits. And the focus, the primary focus of this class and this program was to give Nashville's new recruits a history, a snapshot, a history lesson, I guess we can say, to what role Nashville played, Nashville's police played during the modern civil rights movement and how we could actually utilize this physical space to teach our new recruits about our city, about our city's legacy, and so forth. Because these are the people that our new recruits will be protecting. These are the people that they will be serving. And so po the police contacted us initially about the program. And then we had to decide, how are we going to match the needs and the requests from the police department, which now became one of our largest stakeholders in this program series, how are we going to match their needs with our vision to have this contemporary, ongoing conversation around issues of race and gender and equality and housing as part of our conversations at NPL series? So of course, we thought, like every public library and every public programmer, that our program and how we design it would be transformative, that we would transform lives. But our intent in designing this program was just to utilize history as a gateway to have safe conversations and engage the police recruits about this idea of otherness and how we can have conversations around race in 2015 and 2016, safe conversations about police officers and police response right now contemporary conversations and maybe develop what we've coined as this rebirth of a civil society. Our police department, the trainers wanted to make sure that the recruits understood the neighborhoods that they would be serving in, the people, the actions, and maybe we would create a second layer of empathy also helping to define this rebirth of a civil society. We specifically designed our program um, with several key methods in mind, and, and this is actually the, the methodology and pedagogy of how we designed the program. It was the design was deliberate and strategic, not to be just an open debate where we bring community people together and law enforcement officers together to have this back and forth debate. Our program was designed with key methods, the idea that we would include historical truths, social commentary. We were working, leading our police um, recruits in how to craft narratives and counter narratives. And one key method um, that we use in designing this program was the use of the Socratic method. And so for instance, with the Socratic method, we plan to ask the police recruits questions for clarification, such as how does this image of John Lewis being drugged off of this lunch counter relate to, and then you fill in the blank. Um, we ask questions of these recruits that probe assumptions. What can we assume about the photos that you see in this room? What can you assume about this timeline looking at Nashville's history and chronology? 
how can you verify or disprove these assumptions? We designed our program to be specific in asking questions about viewpoints and perspective. Is there another way to look at this image of a segregationist who's stopping these students from entering his establishment in 1960? So this was the design. This is what we intended the program to be. Now, what does that actually look like in practice? When the recruits walk into the physical space, the image that you see in the middle is an image of the civil rights room. The recruits sit at a replica of a lunch counter. The lunch counter is in a circular in the middle of the physical space. The room is surrounded by images, black and white images, oversized images. Each of the recruits will walk in, have a seat at this lunch counter, look around the room. They will see images of leaders, segregationists, agitators, bystanders, activists. They begin to ask themselves questions about who is this person and who is that person. And staff help lead this conversation in identifying unique stories and unique histories of the people that still live here in our city. We talk a little bit about presumptions and making assumptions about people when we first see them. The program starts with these images in a chronology, starting with 1957 after Nashville's response to the Brown decision. We look at a timeline. We ask students, they are sitting at this lunch counter, and under, on the lunch counter, I'm sorry, the glass, you will see 10 rules that guided the leaders during 1960. Etched in that glass are rules that people like John Lewis or Bernard Lafayette had to follow in order to sustain this movement that took place right here in Nashville. And so the recruits are sitting at a lunch counter looking down at these rules, looking down at these looking at these oversized photos. We draw their attention to a particular day, this day in Nashville's history, a group of photos that are dated April 19, 1960, when one of our local prominent African-American attorneys, Z. Alexander, Z. Alexander Luby's house was bombed in 1960. I asked the recruits to describe in your own words, what does this image mean today? And more than once, more than twice, more than six times, the conversation shifts to this is an act of terrorism. And immediately and deliberately, our conversations go to black and white images of history to a contemporary conversation and program model that looks at terrorism, that looks at acts of violence, that looks at policing and brutality in our society without the library ha ever having to take a particular stand on one hot topic or another. We talk with the recruits about our own perceptions and, and narratives that we thought we knew when we walked into this physical space. We talk about those stories that are stock stories in history, stories that we take for granted, and stories that have been left out of our history books, using this physical room as the platform and as the muse for these conversations. We design um, the program to continue to ask the recruits to think about this physical space. That's the first part of the program. After we have this historic back ground and setting the framework, part two of the program starts. And then the recruits move to a actual physical working and even more safe space. And you see the recruits on both of the images at the bottom of the screens. We move to another space within our main library. This space, the recruits and the participants can actually form teams and small cohorts and how they will work together and grapple through these historic images. We utilize films and oral histories and conversation to tell these ongoing stories of what Nashville was like. And the images that you see below are the police on the left. This group, they're looking at a police officer and, and making assumptions about what is going on and what role the police officers play and what's expected of law enforcement today. And then the young lady on the right, the young recruit on the right, she's actually challenging one of the counter narratives that another group has. So there is this adult learner model that happens in part two of our program. Since we've launched the program last spring, our first class consisted of 60 local police recruits. 
Again, the police came to us. We wanted to make sure when we designed this program on the front end that we set certain standards, that we wanted to have at least a minimum of 20 participants, no more than 60. We wanted to um, make sure that the recruits and the participants understood Nashville's role in civil rights history. We wanted to use a variety of learning styles. We wanted to make sure that they had at least a minimum of three hours of engaged conversations and programs. And today, since um, since we launched the program, we have offered this program for to more than 800 Nashville citizens, and that includes local police recruits. That also includes Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. So every commission agent throughout the entire state of Tennessee have been offered the opportunity to go through this training as well. And our director of TBI, uh, the Bureau of Investigation, required that each of these counties in Tennessee charter a bus and send their commission agents to this physical space to have this three-hour program experience. We're working with our local high schools and creating um, a model, sort of what we started with our police, but now we're using the same model in our classrooms and middle schools and higher, um, higher ed as well. How have we been able to sustain this program? Um, when we launched in the spring of 2015, we provided this program based on existing funds and existing staff within the Special Collections Division. Since that time, we've applied to the Nissan Foundation for a grant to replicate and continue the program. That grant has allowed us to create an accredited curriculum that we actually can utilize throughout Nashville and to replicate in other cities and other states and other institutions. And we also have formalized a train the trainer model um, that we are teaching other institutions how to use their local history and have these safe conversations using what they have with or without a budget, with or without a grant or staffing. One of the things we found pretty compelling um, early on in the program is the response that we received from the Police Citizens Academy. So in addition to the police, the recruits, the TBI agents, we also have provided this program for the Citizens Academy. And that's a group of citizens in our city that follow the police around for six weeks um, in the life of a police officer. And we've offered three classes to our citizens, and many of them they're people of all ages, all demographics, all ethnic groups, and, and class systems. And when they walk into the space, they had one expectation that this is just going to be Nashville. But what we found pretty compelling is that after each one of these citizens-led um, programs, many of the participants have said they've walked away with a new call to action. And now what? We, have, we know all of this history, and what are we going to do with it? And a couple of quotes, and I just want to highlight the one at the bottom. Um, this participant said, hopefully, I can do something that will impact the lives of others. And so what we're finding with this program model is that our participants spend three hours with us. They leave, and they're charged up. And they ask, now what? Do we continue and make this an ongoing program series? Or what is our personal call to action taking this knowledge and moving forward? A few preliminary tips for other libraries who are interested in creating this type of program model. I would suggest that you start with your local history and utilize your own landscape. <clears throat> start by building on supportive or complementary program, complementary program series. Build upon what's already there. You already have a group of stakeholders that you've built within your system utilize those existing partners, those existing stakeholders, who will be committed to this work. Because I have to say that doing all of these trainings and programs since last March, it's very hard work. It's difficult work. There has to be practice of self-care. There has to be practice of having a staff and an administration that understands that the community will be dumping all of their ills and all of their issues on you or, and with our law enforcement officers. So be prepared before you take on um, this type of public program series. Tap into your local communities and create a formalized program plan, not just a great debate type series, 
but maybe look at dialogue circles is just an example. Make sure that your staff are trained. Make sure your staff are prepared. Make sure that you have the support of your administration and your city before moving forward. And a few takeaways and some things that, that we've learned along the way, a couple of bumps in the roads, um, in the road that we've taken on. Some do's, I would say create this, this multiple entry points. When we're creating public programs around contemporary and, and tough issues and questions, don't be afraid to um, take on multiple ways of doing that program. For instance, our program model for our law enforcement officers, we utilize the same method, the same methodology, the same format, and the same questions. When we're working with our high school students, we have different entry points. We're utilizing different films. We're not looking at Nashville school desegregation. We're looking at um, Stanley Nelson's Black Panther's um, Vanguard to a Revolution. We're looking at multiple entry points to have these safe conversations. And be transparent with your community. Don't try to replicate um, a program that's already in existence. Many of our communities and our faith-based institutions and our local government and our mayors and our, and our city officials are already having conversations around what race. We were very transparent early on in letting all of our attendees know that this is a different type of conversation. This is a deliberate program, a deliberate act to bring people together in safety and having these conversations, grappling with what seems and appears to be tough for the rest of the world. And I would advise you to be caution um, to be cautious when you are assigning who's going to lead and facilitate these conversations. Just because a person is a um, political face or an activist um, in your community, I would um, it suggests that you use caution because what will happen is that that person will end up giving his or her opinion and bias throughout the entire conversation. A couple of don'ts, don't shy away from the tough questions. This, this type of programming model is not for the faint at heart. Be prepared to know that your programming will um, yield conversations such as privilege. Be prepared to recognize the nature of privilege. Be prepared to create a conversation that's not a debate. It is really a dialogue. Be prepared to rely solely on your local history if you have to. I see we have logged in people from Maryland and Florida and Kentucky and Virginia and Tennessee. Each of our cities and our communities, they, we have our own history. And build your program based on your city's history, your city's landscape, and then move out. I encourage you not to assume that what you are doing with your public program model is creating um, a, a vaccine for racism or a, a get well or fix it um, type of program. What we're doing is not trying to eradicate racism or there's no vaccine for, for the program model that we're doing. We can't assume the impact that we would have on our community. And I would encourage you to not allow your outcomes to drive your program. Develop your program model based on the needs and the interest of your community and let that be the driving force and not the outcomes. I'll stop there um, to take on questions, but if you are planning to attend PLA Midwinter, I will be leading an all-day institute walking attendees through creating models for their communities and their libraries in an all-day um, institute, a train-the-trainer event. Great. Thank you, Andrea. So we have about seven minutes left, and we'd love to take some questions. Um, so go ahead and type those into the chat box. And it looks like we already have some, so let me go up. Okay. Um, so Kathleen McVeigh asks, I see nearly all white police recruits. Is this representative of the police departments in Nashville? That's a very good question. Um, I will say that the police department, um, the first class, some of the images that you saw were part of the first class that we had. The first class of recruits was um, heavy white male, young white male. Um, and it was pretty startling. But since then, I will say our police department has decided to look at how they are recruiting and they've decided to revamp their recruiting methodology and practices. And the last two classes that we've had of police recruits have had more women 
more um, African Americans, and other ethnic groups as well. So the first class was heavy white male, yes. So that's accurate what you saw. Great, thank you. Uh, Mary Davis Fournier would like to know what sort of training did you and your staff complete to take this? Sure. We, our staff, um, the staff that are engaged in this, you know, we have multiple backgrounds, trained oral historians, educators, um, certified and create and, and facilitate, train facilitators. Um, and so those are just some of the trainings that we, we came into this job and with, into the profession with. Um, we've gone through three-day intensive institutional racism training through various organizations here in town and so forth. So we, we've spent a lot of time having this type of program model within our system. Um, and you, we're utilizing the staff that we're already, you know, conducting and leading um, tough conversations and program anyway, programs. Great, thank you. Um, David Vota wonders how you got police by. So that, that was not hard. Um, the police actually came to us with the idea of, of adding a historic component to their training for their new recruits. So the new recruits here in Nashville, um, they had a small history lesson on the Holocaust, and one of their trainers had visited the civil rights room through a leadership training program, had seen the room, had gone through um, a program with us, and thought that he would take the idea of back to his chief of incorporating the physical space into their existing recruit training model. And so we didn't have to do a lot to have buy-in because they actually approached us. And how did we get the buy-in for tenant, the, the statewide TBI agents? Well, our police chief contacted the director of TBI, and the director of TBI wanted to be involved. Um, I think our police department wanted to be on the front end of saying that Nashville doesn't want to be whatever city. Nashville wanted to be on the front of having conversations with its police department. So we didn't have to struggle hard to get buy-in from law enforcement. Great. Emily Hart is wondering what the original tent of the Civil Rights Room was and what the process of getting something like that up and running was. Well, that's a great question, Emily. The original intent of this, the physical space, the space has been open for 13 years now, the space was designed to highlight and honor Nashville's role during the modern civil rights movement. The space was provided by private do, um, by a private donor, so it is private funds that um, built the space, that helped create the public programs, and that sustained the space as well. Even though we are a city government and a city's municipality, the physical space was all made possible by a private donor um, to highlight Nashville's school desegregation story so that everyone in Nashville and tourists and any researcher would have one clearinghouse, one physical place that they can learn more about Nashville's role during this larger, larger movement, and, and also to provide resources and and the academic support for scholars. And so because it is a privately funded space, we've been very fortunate to provide any of the resources for any third grader wanting to know Tennessee history or any scholar in, in Iowa wanting to know more to provide those resources for free. So that was the original intent, to create a space that at a clearinghouse that people could learn more about Nashville's history. Great. Uh, Kimberly Brown Harden is wondering if you have any advice for a state library that is looking to have a webinar on the library and civil discord. A state library? Um, I would look yeah. at the look at state the who's doing what throughout the state. Um, you want to make sure early on that you bring those stakeholders to the table. Um, since we've launched this program, we've been asked to go to other cities and other states to help replicate our program in their cities and their states and their municipalities. For example, we've been asked to go to Charleston by members of Mother Emanuel Church. Um, we, and before we go, we've, they have decided to bring all of their government officials, their city leaders, their police department, their clergy, and activists together. And so I would start by looking at who's doing the work, who's already on the ground doing the work so that you're not, one, replicating the effort, and two, that you are being a good steward of, of the narrative of your city, and then also that you have buy-in statewide. 
Great, thanks. I think we have time for one more question. So Montoya is wondering what the mayor's response to this program was. So the mayor, um, the mayor was very supportive, has been very supportive of the program. Um, the program, when it was launched, received a lot of national attention. So um, our mayor in our city has a, um, a platform that she's looking at race and equity and justice on a citywide level. So this program um, feeds into to her mission, um, anyway, in her platform for the city. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, thank you for coming on and giving this wonderful presentation and also for all our participants joining us today. Uh, this webinar will be available for viewing on programminglibrarian.org within a couple of hours. Thank you.